during the presentation, just put them in the chat box. Um, you know, we may hold some of them till the end, but uh, yeah, feel free to ask any questions that might come up during the uh, presentation, and I'll make sure that those get to Neil. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. And I just wanted to thank EasyBib for honoring me for being their first uh, professional development seminar this summer. I feel that it's a, a big boost to my ego, and I'm really appreciative of being invited to this. And, uh, and being, uh, having the opportunity to speak to everyone about you know, my perspective on Twitter. Um, so we're going to be talking about Twitter um, kind of in an unusual way. There's so much out there about Twitter and, and education and so forth. So what I try to do in this presentation is focus really on information literacy. And my audience really is librarians, um, probably at the secondary level on up through the uh, college level uh, would probably be the audience for this. So it's going to be a very specialized and focused hat, and I hope I don't talk too fast. I have a tendency to talk really fast, and if you, if I need to clarify something that passed you by, then please, um, I do want to know that. Um, you can mention me on Twitter, and I will answer those questions probably after the webinar, uh, or you can, you know, do that chat box with Katie um, to, you know, to get her attention. If, if there's something really important, I want to address it as soon as possible, just to clarify. Um, again, I'll be uh, talking about. Um, a lot of topics kind of quickly, and again, I, I, I want to apologize in advance if I, if I uh, am too uh, quick with my uh, voice. Okay. So the driving question for today is how has Twitter changed the world of information and how can teacher librarians adapt to this new landscape? I, I think in general our profession has probably been a little bit behind the times uh, with social media, and I'll be talking about that throughout. Um, but I do want to give a kudos to EasyBib because I know I've been assured by their people that they are going to have a, a Twitter a citation feature on the website. And I think that's the kind of thing we really need. We need more of our, our vendors that serve libraries to, to do these kind of things. And, and I'm, I'm going to appreciate that in advance. So, uh, but anyway, our driving question is really how do we respond to this challenge of, of social media in, in numerous ways. Okay, you don't have to have a, a lot of Twitter knowledge for this. Uh, presentation. However, it really does help, and I, I hope that a lot of you out there have a Twitter account and participate in Twitter. If you don't, um, it's, okay, it's at least okay if you at least know that Twitter is out there and that's an important uh, influencing tool in the world of information. Um, it's preferable that you have some experience teaching information literacy, or if you're maybe a pre-service librarian, uh, that you know that it's an important thing that you plan on doing. Um, and it's also real important to have a positive attitude. I mean, it's really easy to have a, a negative attitude about social media. Um, this context is locked. Oh, can you hear me? Um, Sorry about that. We're okay now. I had the uh, message. Okay, so the last thing is really just I, I can, certainly social media does have a downside. I'll be addressing that um, when we talk about hoaxes and conspiracies and so forth. Um, but in general, uh, I think it's important to have a positive attitude because social media, such as Twitter, is not going away. And then it's actually a critical thing to prepare young adults for colleges and career to, to really to master the medium and to, to, um, to be behave responsibly in that medium. So, uh, so those are the kind of the prerequisites that you need. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do a lot of persuasion. I'm going to kind of assume that you already agree with that. Okay, so imagine that we as librarians were driver's ed instructors. And we had no experience driving. Our lessons only focused on what not to do, and our lessons never took place in an actual car. Okay, this is a metaphor that Dan Hassler came up with, but I think it applies to many schools, including my own, where you know, social media is, is really kind of pushed to the side. The persons that mostly speak about, in our case, uh, social media, are police officers that try to convince kids not to do everything. And then the classroom teachers don't always make room for Twitter. And, and I've only had a few lessons where I've actually been able to emphasize Twitter and the social media. So it's really something that I think schools are really behind on um, and that I think it really is up to – because if it wasn't for me, we would have no uh, positive instruction on social media. And, and so I think it's really important for librarians to be involved in this issue. And, Hopefully you'll understand more reasons why as I go through this. Okay, I am going to talk about myself, not so much, uh, you know, just to give you a lot of background on me, but to kind of give you a, a picture of, of my biases and my perspectives, um, because my my presentation is not 
like a lot of others on Twitter. And, and so I'm going to be looking at it through a different lens. And it is all about what I've learned on Twitter and through by experience. Um, so, so that's kind of important to know before I, I go into the, the depth of this. Um, I recently became a parent just last year, and of course that is a very profound change. And it has gotten me thinking about what, how do I want my daughter to uh, learn in, in the future, and how do I, what, what do I want her to learn, and what kind of influences um, should she have in her life, and you know, at what age should she be on social media, and what, you know, what should I, how involved should I be. And, and, and so those questions I've been asking a lot of myself lately. Um, I've been on Twitter since 2010, um, nearly three years since I was at the ISTE conference in Denver. Um, I realized that I needed to be on Twitter at that point because everybody there had knew somebody else there from Twitter, and I felt a little left out. And um, I actually went to a session on Twitter, and during that session I spent most of my time learning Twitter and not paying attention to the lecture, but it, it really got me started on, on Twitter. And, and since then I've been a real Twitter enthusiast, so I'm grateful for, for that. Um, I've been on Facebook since 2008, um, which uh, you know is a, is another social media tool that's influenced um, my thinking about you know social media in general. Um, so it's something I'm quite familiar with, and and I'll, most of what I'm telling you is learned through experience on that, not through you know research articles. Though of course I, you'll see some citations and things I've I've learned by reading research. Um, I've been a, a practicing school librarian in high school level for since 2001, and I've uh, evolved in my practice, um, which I'll talk about. You know, that information literacy when I started was a different ball game, and I think a, a much more simple um, ball game. Um, now, Twitter has made things a lot more complicated, and I think it necessitates a, a sophisticated response on our part. And I'm still formulating that response, so I urge you to be, you know, part of the dialogue. And you know, if you think I'm, I've missed something, then by all means, I, I want to know. And that's, you know, why we, Twitter is such a great place to have that conversation and certainly use the, the, the uh, webinar hashtag if you want to you know, mention anything that I'm leaving out. Um, I, I started my career as a science teacher, which uh, gives me kind of a skeptical view. I, I'm kind of, you know, I think people should think along scientific lines that they should use evidence and consider um, contrary evidence and so forth. And I'm also a, a lifelong introvert, which I means social media is not a natural for me. If you're an introvert, you know, and if I can do it, you can do it. And you know, but extroverts really are the people that uh, thrive on social media, and they, they thrive on those connections. And so, um, you know, but but it's um, it takes all kinds of people, and I'm just one kind of person. Um, I'm also like an amateur researcher. I, I when I work with students, I oftentimes gather data. I use um, student response systems and uh, you know Twitter to gain a pulse of what they're thinking. And I also have um, conversations. So I collect a lot of anecdotal and quantitative evidence as I do things. And I'm going to be talking about that in passing uh, during this presentation. Okay, another personal story, um, a very powerful experience on Twitter for me um, was last year um, during the Dallas tornadoes. Um, since then there's been horrific tornadoes in Oklahoma City um, that also made me remember this experience. But if you can look at this picture, um, it shows uh, a scene just two miles from my school. And this was going on during the school day. And th those things in the picture that are in the air, if I can, I don't know if you can see them very clearly, but those are semi-trailer trucks that are, are swirling about in midair. And, um, and again, this was two miles from our school, um, and it was really something. Now, let me kind of give you a chronology of how things happened that day for me. Um, I was just, um, I take early lunch because I, I like to eat lunch before the students come in during lunch. That's my busy time. So I was eating and looking at Twitter. And I saw a, a link to the weather radar that warned about tornadoes in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, which of course I clicked on. And I noticed that those uh, tornado warning boxes were really, really close to our location, probably within you know, a short striking distance away. Um, I told my principal you know, shortly after that, before the tornado sirens even sounded. So he was already in crisis mode before the tornado sirens uh, went off. And we were already in duck and cover shortly after, you know, when the tornado siren started. So it was that early warning was, was something that was very striking. Um, and the next part of it was really the worst part. Uh, we're, we're in the duck and cover in an interior hallway, and um, the, there's a lot of panic. And um, I was not tweeting during this time. 
However, one thing I was doing was checking Twitter about the tornadoes. And at the same time, um, a little bit later in the duck and cover, two of my colleagues were, were like outside the school filming an actual funnel cloud that I didn't even know about. I mean, it, the, the winds were pretty intense. There was a lot of scared kids because of the, of the dark skies and the, and the uh, torrential rain and the winds. And, but I didn't know there was an actual funnel within eyesight of, of the school. And, and Twitter wasn't telling me that. It was, it was, I, I, wasn't, I was, in fact, getting wrong information that there was tornadoes up where I live, and I was afraid for my apartment and my wife. And, and you know, so I was like, oh, my gosh. But they, they were telling me that the tornadoes were further north, which was, was turned out to not to be true. Um, and then um, there eventually um, I talked to my colleagues who filmed it. We saw the video. Um, I, didn't, I did a tweet during the calm period, and then we had another tornado warning. We went back into duck and cover. Um, so the next slide is, is me tweeting after, after the tornado, the initial tornado scare and the one that was really close. Um, so I, I tweeted. I, I hope you can read the tweet. It says, funnel cloud within sight of school, scared kids, one got sick. Thank God everything is clear now. And uh, I got a tweet back. Uh, <laughs> pretty quickly after that from a, a member of my professional learning network, Paul Wood, who's a technology uh, uh, director. And he gave me, it really turned out to be a very reassuring, you know, and a warning at the same time. It turns out that we already knew that there was a, another tornado warning. And, and so I, but I can say that that conversation made me feel like connected and assured there was somebody else in my situation that was also monitoring it and was offering um, voices of assurance. Okay, so. Here's what uh, I learned about Twitter, you know, in summary during that event, was that that early alert was really the, the, the positive and that, you know, being a part of uh, a shared experience with colleagues was also terrific, that, um, that I was actually a journalist. Um, I did not tweet during the event, but I could have. I actually regret that I didn't know about the tornado and I didn't have a chance to warn more people in the area that, you know, there was a funnel. And, uh, but the downside, though, is that, as I said, many of the tweets that I was reading during the, the crisis and the warning were wrong, and I, I didn't have any way of verifying that information. I, so I, I tended to believe that it was true, and even though I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty sophisticated guy, and I, I had a, no reason to refute um, what was being said about the locations of tornadoes. Um, so the key information was missing when it really counted. And that really, I, you know, like most people, I was too occupied to, to, twit, to tweet during the crisis and therefore contribute to the knowledge of other people. Okay, so that's, that's my personal story. And, and so, you know, the learning by doing is it can't be emphasized enough. And that's really the first topic that I think is real important for librarians to participate in Twitter. And, and to, in order to teach, you have to be in the game. You, you can't just be someone that's learned about it from a book or from me or, for, you know, but you have to learn about it your own way. Um, we're going to be comparing the information search and, and finding information process before Twitter and then after Twitter and how, how much it's really changed the way people receive uh, information. We'll, we'll talk about uh, the new world of Twitter citation and a little bit in passing about decoding the tweets and so that we can kind of make sense and classify them and to cite, cite them. Um, we'll be talking about case studies of hoaxes, which are different from conspiracy theories. As a, as a means of understanding both the pros and cons of Twitter as an information source and as a launch pad to teach information liter uh, literacy. And uh, lastly, we're going to be uh, demoing a, at least one Twitter experience that you could possibly do and, and talking about many others that could be uh, the basis for something that you do in the classroom with students. Okay, here, this is a busy slide that really gets into um, what, it, and it's highly simplified about the way things really are, that in the post-Twitter and the pre-Twitter world, there's been a lot of changes to how people look at information and how they, they come into contact with information, um, and how librarians are, have worked within that context. Um, so if you look at the, the top, um, in the print world, you know, the word current really meant it could be last week, it could be last month, it could be last year, that would all be called current. Um, for a Twitter user, someone that's living in social media, information from minutes ago or even you know, yesterday is probably no longer current. There's, there, it happens all the time where information is replaced by other information, you know, seconds or minutes later, and there's clarifications of, of things that just happened. 
Uh, so the currency is, is, a, is hugely different in that the speed of which information travels is, of course, a, a, a very great consequence to what we do. Uh, in the past, before Twitter, we sold library databases as you know, having better credibility, having better content, and, um, you know, and being better for researchers who wanted to cite and determine authorship and so forth. And now the web is, is much better. Uh, it's more transparent in many ways. Um, and it, you know, and it, it's faster, but um, it really, um, I think we can still sell our databases. It's not that you know we have to give up on our databases, uh, but that we sell them differently. That they're they're more they're better places to learn deeply about a, a topic and better to do serious research, and and in many ways more steady and reliable. Um, though again, I think if we ignored what's on the internet, that would be a mistake. Because again, I see the quality of information on Twitter and blogs and so forth being much higher than it used to be. Um, in the past, I think credibility was synonymous with, with you know, publishing houses, with cr uh, credible institutions, with, with, with good authors and so forth, good researchers, journals. Uh, in Twitter, you have uh, a new reality emerging where a lot of people that were, would have been overlooked are now being paid attention to in Twitter because they've been good at promoting themselves and to developing uh, trust relationships and, and to determining credibility. And it's really up to the, the people more than ever to determine who is credible. And again, that's, um, that's a critical point that you know, we, we have to teach people how to determine who is credible. Um, in the past, I think um, people that search for information, they weren't socially connected at the same time they were searching. Um, in the Twitter era, this information search and social networking have, have really blurred. And, People find things through people that they know, and sometimes they know them online, but they trust them. Um, and a lot of this is exploited for marketing and political persuasion. Uh, so, you know, that's another layer of complexity uh, that I think Twitter brings to the to the information world. Okay, now we'll start with a, a little bit more of a, you know, I just said how complicated it is. Well, this is a fairly straightforward topic. Um, MLA, Chicago, Turabian, all of the major a APA, they've all developed a recommended or standard citation method for tweeting, or for, for documenting tweets. And what's really neat about tweets is that the entire tweet fits into the citation. <laughs> you, you know, nowhere else in the information world can you put an entire article in a, in a citation. Uh, or, you know, so it's really, it's really extraordinary. You would, you would put the title, but in the case of Twitter, the title is really uh, the tweet and the entire tweet. So this one, I, I think, if you recognize it, it's the famous tweet um, by a man who goes by the the screen name Really Virtual. He is a Pakistani um, computer programmer, and he uh, he tweeted the first um, possible knowledge of the Osama bin Laden operation in Pakistan. Uh, so that was the tweet that that really it didn't it only broke the story to the people that followed him. So it became Kind of after the fact, a kind of a big deal that Twitter was knew about the the top secret mission before most everybody else. Um, so there are some rules um, that are in. I mean, I'm using MLA because that's what I use at our school, and um, but there's a lot of precise rules as as they. Um, I'm not going to read them to you. Um, there's even finer points about the time of the tweet um, and when that's um, cited because there's a lot of complexity about time zones and so forth. And um, you know, so as I mentioned before, I, I give kudos to EasyBib for for formulating formulating a um, tweet system for for Twitter. And I, I'm going to look at that carefully when it's out, and, and to see if it, it makes these all these complex uh, rules about tweets more intuitive. So it's um, it is um, something that um, I am going to be looking at in the future, and I urge everyone to to pay attention to that feature and to maybe exploit it for for teaching information literacy. Um, okay, the Twitterverse is a strange world. It's not like, I mean, everybody's on the same um, platform and everybody can self-promote and gain followers. And it, it's only natural that celebrities are, are the drivers, uh, or the main, um, they are, they dominate Twitter. And if you look at the top 100 um, Twitter by followers, Twi Twitterholic is, um, is, a, is a place that automatically monitors um, followers and who's up and who's down in Twitter. And Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber are number one and two. Um, what's really important to realize about these celebrities is that, and generally speaking, they're not managing their own Twitter account. That they're really public relations tools. 
and they, they are very sophisticated, engaging the fans and promoting the latest things the artist is doing. And, and so really, you know, it's not information the way librarians would like to think of it. It's, 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 it is public relations, uh, to make a long story short. Number four on the Twitterholic list is President Obama. And I put that in quotes because, of course, the president himself is not tweeting. Um, but he does do tweets that uh, are authoring that are authored by him. Um, mostly the accounts run by his political action committee, Organizing for Action. Um, and it's really designed to connect to followers or supporters of the uh, president and to help him push uh, his agenda through Congress. Um, but really, in, in a sense, it's a lot like the other, um, you know, like Lady Gaga and, and Justin Bieber, that it's run by highly paid professionals and who really know how to play social media uh, and to possibly attract new support and, and, uh, and to, you know, keep the existing supporters engaged. Okay, there's been a lot of upheaval in the traditional media universe. Uh, I, there's been a lot of traditional print publications that have been basically destroyed um, and or severely uh, negatively affected by Twitter and the, and the Internet in general. Um, some organizations uh, and, you know, have adopted very well um, for different reasons. Um, CNN has really taken the lead uh, of breaking news. Um, they have 12.2 million followers. And uh, that means that they really, I mean, there's other news agencies that try to capitalize on, on fast-breaking news, but CNN has like five times as followers as uh, AP and uh, Reuters and so forth. Um, so they've really succeeded in being the brand that has breaks accurate news. So people trust CNN to break the news accurately. And um, so that's why they have the kind of following they do. Um, with the New York Times, they really have a great global brand, um, and, and they've maintained that in uh, Twitter. And they, so their, their Twitter following is about what their circulation used to be. Um, and, so they, and, and same with Time. They've, it's a national publication that used to have around the same amount of circulation as followers. And um, so they've maintained their audience and adapted quite well to the social media world, and, and they keep their readers engaged that way. And the Economist and Wired magazines are niche publications that have excelled at creating global brands. Um, the Economist, of course, is business and world economy type news. And Wired is, is focused on the tech world. And I'm going to be talking about Wired magazine and its role in, uh, in, in various um, case studies that I'm going to talk about. As I said, a lot of um, news organizations and, and publications have not uh, adapted very well. Um, Newsweek is a big loser. Um, their, their print circulation has plummeted. Their, um, the Daily Beast, which is the former, you know, is the name for the former Newsweek, has a fraction, only 20% of the followers that Time has. So they used to be kind of even with Time, uh, or at least a little, only a little behind. Now they're really behind uh, Time Magazine, uh, and of course that that's going to drastically affect, you know, who's influential, you know, in, in the real world. Um, Bloomberg is um, Business Week was used to, Business Week used to be one of the greatest um, publications they've lost. Now Forbes has been a winner in business um, publishing, um, but Business Week has, has suffered. Um, and they've had they put a lot of effort into social media. It just hasn't succeeded uh, the way that others have. Um, and anyway, I do think Business Week is a great publication. It's just not getting the kind of eyeballs that others are. Uh, so it's kind of sad um, that some of these um, things are, and Reader's Digest is only is one of the one of the you know biggest print um, media uh, is is barely a factor on Twitter, and sadly, EBSCO databases, which is really library services, um, has a pathetic Twitter following, and I think that really is an indicator that uh, the library world has been slow to respond um, to Twitter, and I think it really hurts um, us as a profession and it hurts our, our credibility. So um, I'd like to see um, library-related things um, get more attention on social media, and that, and that takes, I think, effort on our part. Okay, um, so hopefully you've all experienced Internet hoaxes. I, I find them entertaining. Um, the example I'm, I have on the screen is malepregnancy.com, um, the, the pregnant man. It was um, a fun little hoax. Um, a lot of hoaxes are really designed to get attention. Um, this one, I think, was just a practical joke. Um, and, uh, you know, you could follow the website, but, you know, it wasn't updated. So you could see that this guy was always pregnant. He never gave birth, you know. So it, it was a slow pace, and, um, and Snopes.com was a, a lot of librarians would use Snopes to um, tell people, no, that's really a hoax.
you know, and and you really check out the facts. So, it, but it was a slower pace, and you had um, you didn't have the kind of rapid fire spread of these kind of things like you do now. Um, and a lot of like myself, I I used a lot of these hoaxes to teach information literacy because basically the message is anybody can post anything on the internet, and of course that doesn't mean it's true. And you know, we used websites like the Pacific Northwest Tree Octopus, the um, Clones RS, and many, many other bogus websites that were actually, some of them were set up by librarians to illustrate this point that the Internet's not as reliable as, as the databases or, and you really should be careful about what you read on the Internet. Um, now on Twitter, you know, the spread is just rapid fire and, and, and the truth is often out really quickly as well, but it's, you know, it's believed at the point that it's released. Now, I hope you heard about this. Um, it was like really just a few months ago that the Twitter feed of the Associated Press was hacked by pranksters and they tweeted about um, the White House being bombed and that the President was injured. And um, I think, you know, to me, I went, if I saw this tweet when it happened, I don't know if I would have believed it. Um, however, a lot of people did and they didn't triangulate, they didn't investigate it. And what did they do on Wall Street? They sold stocks like crazy for like a few minutes they were panic selling a lot of securities and you can see the graph that there was like this minute period where the stocks just plunged um, but the correct information came out quickly that it was a, a hacking episode and that it was uh, the president was fine and uh, but this tweet initially fooled the gate uh, a lot of people that were fully vested in in knowing this the facts and um, so the hoaxes now are fooling really sophisticated people um, the next example is the Apple screw hoax of last year. Um, this one um, was in, originated in Sweden, and what these gentlemen they 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 made uh, tr they took the trouble of of creating a fake screw uh, schema a schematic, and they made it look like a uh, uh, an email from Apple that had been intercepted, um, and and they uh, they posted this fake email and this fake uh, screw uh, scheme schematic of on a Reddit, which if you've heard of Reddit, Reddit is kind of a, a place where a lot of techie people get the news about the tech world and, and kind of hipsters and so forth. I'm not on Reddit, but I'm on uh, Twitter. Um, so, but a lot of people in Silicon Valley read Reddit and they uh, spread information to Reddit and then of course it jumps to Twitter. Um, so the, this was really an experiment by the hoaxers. They wanted to see you know, what would happen with this thing, which they thought was a really easy to spot as a fake. Um, but what happened was in, in some ways not all surprising that the Reddit from Reddit it made to blogs because everyone wants to break the news fast and it, this screw looked realistic enough and the email looked authentic enough and and by the end of the day um, the mainstream websites like Yahoo News and Wire magazines picked up the story and and by the end uh, by the evening you had millions of people that were relatively sophisticated interested techie people believing that Apple had designed this screw to thwart the do-it-yourself um, people that, that take apart Apple devices and, you know, to try to hack them and to make them do what they want to do. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about the screw as, it was, it was as if it was a real thing when, of course, it was completely uh, made up. I mentioned Wired Magazine, which is, is I consider a traditional journalistic source. Um, and this is the tweet that happened on the same day of, uh, as the Reddit release. And, and from the tweet, if you look at the tweet, it says, why Apple's custom iPhone screws can't stop the DIY, the do-it-yourself community? And, um, and you see there's a story link to that, which indicates that they've you know, looked at these things and that they've, they've made an assessment that this is just not going to work the way Apple has intended it to work. Um, so. So the people just looking at this on Twitter are going to assume that Wired really also was also fooled. Okay, that turns out not to be the case. However, if you just look at that Twitter, um, you would think that. So here's a, a tweet five days later. This is after the hoax had really been well um, established as a hoax, and, uh, and and Wired wanted to save its reputation because in the, on the Twitter world you have to be accurate or you lose credibility. So what, what Wire did after the fact was they posted the same story, the same exact story, with a different tweet and it says, P.S. on the Apple hoax, many news outlets, including our Gadget Lab, did flag it as a probable fake. Okay, so um, Wire, yes, they did do investigating. However, um, you had to click on the link uh, in the tweet to really get to that Gadget Lab research on the fake screw. 
Um, so this slide is really long, but what it really says is that um, the authenticity of the screw is in question. Um, and, and while, um, you know, and then, oops, let me go back to that. Um, that if you, they, they, they describe the research and the people they've talked to and that, that really think that this is an unrealistic and, and probably not a likely um, thing that actually Apple would do. That it, it just wouldn't make financial sense or business sense to do this. And, and so that was the assessment of the traditional journalists. Um, however, most people didn't read that because they didn't look past the, the fast burning uh, news feeds. So, so many sophisticated people believe it, and probably still some people are still waiting for those devices with the fake screws to come out. Um, though I think by now most people realize that it was a hoax. Okay, so what do, what do hoaxes like this teach us about Twitter? Um, well, I do think that it really says that traditional journalists that are on Twitter have an important role. Wired Magazine, I think, should be read by people. I think people should pay attention to what these, um, what these entities are, are doing. They're not always going to be right, but they are, you know, com they, they are committed to maintaining their credibility. And that, that's a strong incentive not to spread bad information. Um, and that reading thoroughly you know, is, is not done by a lot of people, but it's really important. And I think we, we have to encourage our students to you know, investigate, click on the links, read. Uh, you know, otherwise you're going to be fooled. Um, and that, you know, the, the other thing for our students they need to know is that if you retweet bad information, you're not going to have a lot of credibility yourself. So, you know, you have two things. You have to follow credible people, get information from real people, and you have to be credible at the same time. Um, okay, conspiracy theories are, are, are quite a bit different than the hoaxes because of the type of people that spread them. Hoaxes are publicity stunts. Um, that are oftentimes, you know, to generate web traffic to your website. And so they're done deliberately, they're, they're misleading. Um, and, and, but the hoaxers know that. They know that what they're doing isn't, isn't true. Um, conspiracy theorists are, are huge on the Internet because, um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's the perfect platform for someone that wants to get out the truth. They believe the truth is what they believe. You know, they, they think that it's real important to spread the truth, in quotes, as they see it. Um, and uh, there's some examples of, of, of conspiracies. Uh, of course, conspiracy theories have been wrong along for many years. However, um, the conspiracy communities have flourished since Web 2.0, since about the you know the early 2000s when uh, you had the blogs and and YouTube coming on. The, these conspiracy communities became very well established and at producing um, materials that are are very inaccurate. Um, the one I'm going to talk about is the anti-vax movement. Um, as I said, my daughter has got me thinking about this. Um, I, I kind of resent having to get uh, a booster shot and, and uh, a new vaccine because of the amount of resurgence of certain infectious diseases that were really brought about by this anti-vax movement. Um, two people I know have had whooping cough. <laughs> it was an extinct illness um, almost, and, and now it's come back because of, of these. So th these conspiracy theories have real consequences um, for, for the health of people and for also, the, I, I think, our democracy. And um, so I, I think it's real important to pay attention to these uh, things and what, how they're being spread on the web. And, and to see, we're going to investigate how Twitter um, can help and hurt um, in, with the spread of these theories. Okay, so this slide is, this is a very, um, a lot of data. This is all data that I collected about the anti-vax movement on, on various platforms. Um, if you look at the left column, it's about EBSCO. I don't know if you can see that the left column is our library database, EBSCO. Um, the middle column is Twitter, and the, the, the right column is uh, YouTube. And this is a comparison of these three information sources. And you'll see that when you, when you do a search for vaccines on EBSCO, that none of those search results have conspiracy type of uh, leanings. In other words, these are, you're not going to see things about toxins and vaccines that cause autism um, and various scare tactics that uh, conspiracy theorists use to get you to not use vaccines. So, so EBSCO is good at the credibility. You don't have this inaccurate information at all a factor in EBSCO. So, so that's, that's a, a good plus for, for library databases. Um, now, with Twitter, um, I looked at the top 10 tweets. Um, a lot of them were about a band called the vaccine, so I had to discount those in my um, count. But of the, of, the, of the top 10 tweets that were really about vaccines, seven of them were, um, were actually conspiracy type of tweets. Uh, YouTube was even worse that nine out of 10 of the top search results about vaccines 
were um, scary conspiracy videos um, about you know why you should not be vaccinated, why you shouldn't have your children uh, vaccinated. Um, on EBSCO, the, the first result was a was a pro vaccine result, and on Twitter, um, this is an important difference between Twitter and YouTube. Um, the first result on Twitter was a pro vaccine, and um, and on YouTube, you didn't see a pro vaccine um, result until the eighth uh, on the list, um, and that result happened to be from an atheist group um, that believes in rationality. And, and so, again, since atheism is controversial and vaccines shouldn't be, that, you know, you should, uh, you know, recognize that really YouTube is a bastion of conspiracy thinking and that people that believe in, um, you know, science and so forth are kind of in the minority on YouTube. And even on Twitter, it seems as though they are, uh, but there's some important differences um, between Twitter and YouTube and blogs in general. Um, the, um, the, the, the top tweet um, had on Twitter um, which was anti-vaccine had 42 um, re, uh, retweets, and of those there were 4,277 followers. And the, uh, I'm sorry, that's the conspiracy. The, so you can see if you compare the the second from the top, bottom column to the bottom column, here you have the, the the conspiracy traffic is actually less than the the pro-vaccine uh, activity. You had more retweets, more followers of. Of, of people that were pro-vaccine than anti-vaccine. Now, on YouTube, we went by views. Um, the the anti-vaccine conspiracy videos have been watched twice as often as the, as the um, anti-conspiracy pro-vaccine video. So it's a different world. And, and so let's look at another slide about Twitter. Um, who's influential on Twitter about vaccines? Um, the top influencers on, on, uh, that are pro-vaccine on uh, Twitter are the Gates Foundation, Ask a Doctor, which is a paid uh, website run by doctors, and the UN World Health, Health Organization. These all have over 800,000 followers. The biggest um, anti-vax personality that's an influencer on Twitter is Jenny McCarthy. Uh, with 900 plus thousand followers, the, the conspiracy journalist uh, Alex Jones has only 200,000 followers. So the next uh, most influential people are not anywhere near as influential as the um, um, as the people that are, are pro vaccine um, and you know, that want to save lives through vaccines and to stop people from getting sick and so forth. Um, so it's real uh, to me that's very encouraging that um, that a lot of these you know people are kind of well not taken seriously by the vast majority of Twitter users and they aren't getting the quite the attention that the more credible sources are. Um, so it's really, like I said, I think that's a plus in, in Twitter's um, defense, even though, like you can see, there's plenty of conspiracy traffic on, on, on Twitter. Okay, so what does it tell us? What, is, what are hoaxes and conspiracies? Well, it, just, it says there's, there's more, certainly mo more bogus information on Twitter and social media and, and the Internet in general than the databases. But however, on Twitter, the, the concern for credibility and your own reputation is a powerful preventer of the spread of, well, of false rumors. You know, I wouldn't want to be associated with Alex Jones if I was interviewing for a job in a, as a librarian. Um, you know, it, I think it's an important um, credibility uh, thing to, to not be associated with some of these things. Um, and for me, I, even if I wanted to believe these conspiracies, I would be um, chastened and, and not wanting to pass along conspiracy information just because I'm concerned about getting a job and maintaining my um, credibility. Um, the anonymity of, uh, of YouTube is, is really where conspiracies, conspiracies fly. You know, because a, a lot of people don't um, put their real names on YouTube. On Twitter, it's, a, it's true that many people don't use their real name. However, the mainstream is that you will, you know, your identity will be transparent. Um, and that your location and your, your descriptor is really going to help people understand, you know, what kind of uh, person you are. And, and, and so forth, give them some clues about um, what kind of information that you um, pass on. Um, but again, on YouTube, um, it's opposite. Now, I would also add that YouTube is a video medium, uh, and of course, the video medium is perfect for spreading conspiracy theories because there's no opportunities to have a rebuttal, and uh, whereas on Twitter, um, you're seeing different views at the same time, and, uh, we're, and it, it's not as manipulative as inherently as video. Um, I'm citing a, a source here called Digital Trends, which is a terrific source. I've been, I just found out about another hoax on Digital Trends on Twitter as 
I was getting ready for this talk about um, the anti-vegan, um, the former vegans um, hate site, which was um, really designed just to get publicity. So you learn about these things, uh, and um, places like Digital Trends is a, is a great source for the latest um, hoaxes, conspiracies, and happenings on Twitter, even if you're not following Twitter um, very closely. Okay, so final points about hoaxes and conspiracies. Um, there's some key differences, and um, the, um, I have to move kind of quickly, but, um, but the concept that we're worried about are people being in information bubbles and, and not critically thinking. And, and I think um, I, since I have to move on quickly, I'm going to have to kind of let you read that slide. Um, well, we, as librarians, what do we have to do um, to, in our instruction that we can address these conspiracies and hoaxes? Um, the most commonly promoted strategy is triangulation, using three disparate sources to, to check your facts. Um, and that we have, to do, we have to stress the importance of critical thinking and impulse control, um, which I think can really help people in social media because uh, impulse, impulsivity, especially among young adults, is very high, and, and helping them control their impulses will help them in, in many, many ways, um, least of which is to, is to stop them from losing credibility. But, but I think that's an important point. That's where we come in. Get, encourage them to, to, to mine their online reputation, to be uh, careful about what they spread. Um, and um, you can also compare and contrast the videos on YouTube. Since there's so much conspiracy video on YouTube, you can show them those conspiracy videos and contrast those with uh, you know, more, uh, more scientific type of videos. Um, we can also model our behaviors um, and like, um, you know, by, by paying attention to diverse people. Um, so you don't live in a bubble of people that only think one way. And of course, that's conspiracies thrive in information bubbles. And um, Twitter is, is, if you do it correctly, um, it's not an information bubble. Okay, so uh, I talk about things, uh, Twitter with students, and I've learned some things by mistake. Um, it's real important to be positive. Um, don't just say, you know, teach social media is dangerous. Uh, and don't criticize uh, what the students already do um, unless it really is a serious disciplinary issue. I've had to argue with kids because they have done things that were harmful to their peers on Twitter. Um, and they, they view it as their right that to post whatever they want on Twitter. Um, and um, my telling them that it's not really true is, is not going to convince them, uh, at least and since I work in an urban setting. Um, that's, that's what I've learned from my population, that you know, the kids are adamant that you, know, you can post whatever you want on Twitter, um, you know, and you can't tell me what to do. And I say, well, I can take away your computer. And, and they say, fine, but you know, they're not going to back down. And, um, and of course, that's not true for everyone, but it's real important to emphasize the, the positive. Um, and as a teacher, you want to tell them about your experiences um, and, and be credible. You have to be a Twitterer. Um, you can't tell kids to, how they should act on Twitter when you don't uh, participate in Twitter. You have no credibility. Um, and you, as a teacher, you can provide uh, things about you know, specific advice, like who to follow, need people to follow, people that will help them in college and so forth. Um, you can teach a lot of things directly um, about Twitter, like you can teach you know, credible and non-credible sources. You can talk about triangulation. Um, your plagiarism um, is, is, is an interesting theoretical question that if you're, is plagiarism re is retweeting plagiarism? Um, under what circumstances is it plagiarism? There's a, the, the tweet that I pictured here is actually meant to be funny. Um, there's a lot of uh, corollaries between Twitter citation and traditional citation. Um, and what kind of sources there are, this original synthesis and derivative, which I don't really have time to get into, um, versus primary, secondary, and tertiary. And so it, it provides an interesting um, contrast, which I have in my bibliography, there's a really good article that I'll refer you to, to, um, to the, that um, kind of thing. Um, okay, what research topics are suited for Twitter? Um, well, um, I find since I, I had that tornado experience, that disasters are really, really rich. Um, Fast-breaking stories like you know terrorist attacks around the world, even sporting events, are, are things where you can get a lot of um, perspectives about conspiracies and not conspiracy things, and um, and and yeah, exer they're exercises in sorting out the facts from the fiction, and um, and uh, so really it's it's a terrific medium for for having for practicing critical thinking uh, in so many different ways. Um, the last one I'm mentioning is careers and colleges, which I'm going to give you a real example on. Um, you know, if you think about it, you know, I always refer kids to the, um, the occupational outlook online for career information. But what's great about Twitter is you can get real, um, real information from real people that are actually at these colleges and, and really um, many, many more, more information sources uh, uh, than you would otherwise. So um, 
that career in college thing is we're going we're gonna to actually play a game. Uh, it's actually a learning activity that you could do um, with, um, with, the, um, with uh, Twitter um, as a learning tool, as a, a real-time uh, learning tool. So we're going to try to do this. So the rules of this game, uh, the game is called Should I Cite This? We're going to be looking at tweets that are, um, if, you're, are really, if you're doing college and career uh, research, um, I'm only going to show these tweets for about, well, five, I'm going to give you five seconds of think time. Um, the slide will still be up for five, more than five seconds, but I want you to try to respond um, in a tweet or a chat that's, uh, you know, yes, I should, would cite this, no, I would not cite this, or it depends, um, maybe I would cite this, maybe not. Um, you can um, use the conference hashtag, which I believe is um, EasyBibPD or something. Um, and, or you can mention me and use the should I type this hashtag on Twitter if you um, uh, would um, care to comment on these tweets. Okay, so we're going to go and play should I cite this. Um, so the first tweet is right here. Um, so I, hopefully you'll, you'll just read. I'm going to give you five seconds to think, and we'll see what kind of votes we get as should, should I cite this. Okay, so um, I, I can't really get a sense of how many people out there, but um, um, Katie, can, can you tell me what, what are we are we hearing from our audience? Yes, we are, Neil, and we're getting some overwhelming no's here in the chat. Okay, I'm not surprised. Um, however, I wanted to point out, uh, yeah, and I, I agree with that. I, I think you know, obviously, this is the daughter of a, of a nursing professor at a certain college, and you know, she's now she could be thinking that maybe my mom. I just want to get something from my mom. Maybe I want the car keys, or you know, maybe I want this, and that's why she's doing this. Or, or maybe she really feels this way. Um, in which case, you might want to take a look at the AU, I'm assuming Arizona or somewhere university, and what's their nursing program, because maybe maybe she is a great professor. But I, I, again, I certainly wouldn't cite that as a, as a source. Okay, the next tweet. Um, this is from another um, college student, I believe. We'll, we'll do this one quickly since we're running out of time. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of gloss over this one, but basically it's not much different than the other one I'm assuming, um, that it really um, is someone whose her profile doesn't look very credible. It doesn't really indicate who she is, and, there, and there's no link. Um, that's an important thing to notice here is that um, the, uh, there's no link to any information that backs this up. Okay, let's contrast this with um, tweet number three. Um, this is from Forbes. Okay, so let's, let's um, ask the question, should I cite this? And we'll hear from our, our studio audience. We're getting a lot of yeses on this one, Neil. Yeah, and, and of course it really helps to check the link, um, but there is a link, and it does go to Forbes, and it provides a lot of data. Um, and it's going to say pretty much what the last person just said, that you know, the engineering majors are, are great and, um, and so forth. And, and it a actually adds more majors that it might be worth considering. Um, for a future college student. Um, okay, the next one is, um, um, this is an interesting case. Um, there's key differences between this one and the previous. Um, and let's see what you think about this one. Okay, um, what are we hearing on this one? This one we're getting a little more of a mixed response. A lot of it depends. We'd need to go to the source to check yeah, or exactly. depends on the link. We have a sharp audience, I, I think, because this is actually a retweet, right? There's an RT there. Um, so NACE.org is the original source of the tweet, which is a, um, it's a uh, careers in, um, I forgot what the actual NACE is, but uh, anyway. Uh, but they published an it's their own article that they published in Slate, which is an online journal of, of pretty high credibility. Um, but certainly checking out the link is also uh, worth it. But again, this tweet you shouldn't probably cite because it's a retweet and that probably should get um, probably closer to the source. Um, okay, this is more or less like the others. Um, <laughs> I just think it's kind of funny. But um, let's suppose that, you know, that somebody in your class is wanting to consider pre-med or chemistry as a major. Um, and this is an actual person that you assume is either in pre-med or chemistry. Um, so should I cite this? If I'm, if I'm a student, I'm trying to decide if chemistry or pre-med is the right major for me. Uh, we're getting up mostly no's on this one. Yeah, um, and I would say, I would tend to say no as well. Um, however, um, as a contrary opinion, 
Um, I would also say that since this is a, a young adult that's actually experiencing um, the pre-med major, they, they do have a perspective and, and that certainly that it indicates that, you know, a science major is hard uh, compared with maybe what they perceive their friends are going through in college and, and maybe it's actually discouraging, but it isn't. Maybe, maybe it is honest, uh, I, you know, who knows. So, but again, I, I wouldn't necessarily want my, if I wanted my daughter to major in um, science, I, which I do, I, I don't think uh, I would want her to see that, but, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a bit of information that, that's out there. Okay, I appreciate. Thanks everyone for for playing and uh, and for listening to this long uh, webinar. Um, and now I'm open for um, questions. Okay, um, if anyone has any other questions that they'd like to put in the chat box, um, please go ahead and do that. Um, I've collected a few uh, from uh, throughout the presentation, and uh, I'll be happy to read those out to you now. Neil, uh, give me one second. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we got was, uh, why is it that everyone loves fake Twitter accounts? Uh, is it the Daily Show effect? Do you have any insight uh, on it, on that for us, Neil? Um, well, I didn't even talk about fake Twitter accounts. I, I talked about a real Twitter account that was hacked. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was one like, what was it? The, they, I find them entertaining and, and therefore relatively harmless. Like there was the one about the cobra that got out of the Bronx Zoo, and there was somebody that. That I, I just find that entertaining. Um, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> to me, uh, I actually followed the Bronx Zoo Cobra, you know, for a while. Um, but I don't have anything deep to say about it, though. Um, to me, I think that's part of the fun of Twitter, though. Okay, great. Um, and then one of the other questions that we had was, um, in your analysis of social media outlets, uh, do you ever look at Vimeo? And I think this question came up because. Uh, uh, YouTube is quite often blocked at many school districts. Right. Um, the truth is, um, yes, we, I've certainly had exposure to Vimeo. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I, I can't comment on if their editorial policy or their, their search algorithm is better than, than, um, than um, YouTube, I mean, which YouTube seems to favor popularity exclusively, um, which I think is what brings up the conspiracies to the top of the chart. Um, and I, I don't have that kind of experience with Vimeo, though again, we use Vimeo a lot. Um, YouTube is not blocked for our teachers um, at school, mm -hmm. and our students can get through the teachers to YouTube. So um, YouTube is, of course, much more popular, and therefore more important um, in the information landscape. It's, it has more, um, I mean, the number of videos being viewed by um, YouTube is astounding. Like six billion hours a month are, of videos are watched on YouTube, and, and, and it's just really, it's very influential. And, people thinking, and, it, it, and Vimeo has only a fraction of the actual influence. Right. Uh, and what are your thoughts, Neil, on uh, blocking YouTube at schools? Is that something that you think is a good idea uh, because of the questionable content that's out there, or are we blocking students uh, from more uh, useful content that they could be using? Um, well, in our school we have a hybrid approach. The teachers can get to it. The students technically can't. So, of course they do. so I don't think blocking is a solution at all. Um, and uh, the only reason I would, I would ever endorse blocking would be because of the bandwidth issues that are associated with streaming video. If, you're, if you're, your schools don't have the bandwidth um, and for streaming right. video, perhaps you should. But I, I don't think it helps at all to, to block it. Uh, I think it's much better to have it uh, open and, and discussable um, in part of, you know, because just by blocking a school, you're not going to, of course, limit its influence in any way. Right. Okay, great. Um, and then this question uh, may have been a little bit rhetorical, but I will repeat it anyway. Um, someone uh, pointed out, uh, does following um, someone uh, equate, or having a lot of followers, equate to influence or validity? Um, yes. Um, I, I think that there is a strong correlation between um, Twitter following and, and credibility. Uh, of course, that's not mutually exclusive. You can have high following with low credibility. Um, but it really is up to the users to determine who's credible. I mean, some people think Jenny McCarthy is credible, and a lot of people think Alex Jones is credible. Um, I think, fortunately, right now, more people think that you know the uh, mainstream sources are more credible. Um, but there's a battle um, going on, and um, and you can see that there's. I, I don't I don't have a definite answer as to more. Is there more conspiracies now? I, I have a feeling there are, and that people are believing. Probably more things that aren't true. I, I don't think that it may not be true. I, don't, I, I was trying to find research, and I really couldn't find anything definitive on that. Um, but certainly, notions of credibility are evolving. 
Um, and, um, and certainly when you look at clout, which is a, a measure of influence, clout.com, um, certainly followings and engagement. It's, so it's not just following, mm -hmm. it's also engagement, who you engage with, um, uh, which is the other um, part of the equation. So, so yeah, following is strongly correlated with clout and influence, but it's not the only um, part of it if you're sophisticated. Right. Okay. Great. Uh, and then uh, someone else also said that uh, you, when you were listing uh, your dues as a librarian for students in Twitter, uh, she mentioned that it's also important to remind students that their digital footprint is important to their future. Uh, so, and she says the extent to which employers investigate the same. Is that something that you're discussing with your uh, students? Um, yeah, I, of course I've done that. However. My experience is that it doesn't always have an impact because they're not thinking of the future. Right. I mean, they're thinking of the future now. Um, so, I, 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 yes, I, I think you should say it. Um, but I, I'm just, I just can tell you that I've, I know I've talked to certain kids. I know the police officers said certain things. Um, and the kids, some of them will do it anyway. They'll do things that are really um, harmful. They'll brag about their drug use. They'll brag about their, you know, sexual activities and, and various other things that are inappropriate. Um, and so they'll do all of the no's because they're teenagers. And, um, you know, so uh, my point is, though, you can't just dwell on that, um, that you really have to think more holistically. Um, um, but, you know, but I, I, it is a concern, and I am concerned uh, about what they're doing, and I, I do think it can be harmful to them in, in many ways, not just to their future, but to their now and the kind of people they might need. And, and, and you know, so it, it is a concern. And um, so I, I think you have to have the dialogue, and you have to have a lot of uh, trust and credibility with your students that even have any influence. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, we're getting a lot of thank yous in here. Uh, let's see this. Just let me back up a little bit. Um, we actually had a comment from someone that this was uh, this presentation was not just helpful to librarians, but also uh, to uh, the attendee who happened to be a history teacher. So thanks again, Neil. This was really great. Um, and if you didn't get your question answered, I'll make sure to uh, copy that, and we'll send that along to Neil so we can get an answer for you. Uh, so thanks again for all of your participation. This was great, both through the chat box and on Twitter as well. Okay. Are those all the questions? Um, we do have a few more, but they're coming in a little fast and we're kind of running out of time. So um, what I'm going to do, Neil, is I'll make sure to forward those to you. And of course, um, you can email me at Caitlin at Imagine Easy, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions for you. Uh, or you can also reach Neil via Twitter uh, at uh, TXLibraryGuy. Right, and I'll, I'll answer any, um, any if you direct message or you know mention me, I'll, I'll answer any questions that way. I also wanted to mention that um, I did do a bibliography through EasyBib, and um, it's not complete yet. I'm still adding to it. Um, but if you're interested in that for further reading, um, I can send you the list. Since I, I am very grateful for EasyBib for sponsoring this, that I wanted to help um, by showing what um, the bibliography tool can do and it, with some of my comments on it. So I didn't just uh, cite the sources that I recommend. Um, I'm also commenting on why they're um, good sources. And so if you're interested in receiving that and getting that shared, um, by all means, just send me an email to that email address, nskrasnoff at gmail.com, or you could direct message me on uh, Twitter if you're interested in the bibliography and the suggested reading. Okay, and that's it. I appreciate okay, it. Okay, great. Um, sorry, Neil, go ahead. I want to thank everyone. I really appreciate everyone joining and, and, and listening. Okay. Yes, thank you so much everybody. Uh, and again, uh, that email address is C-A-I-T-L-Y-N at ImagineEasy.com. But that will also be uh, sent out with a uh, follow-up survey that we'd like you all to take about the presentation uh, and just about uh, other professional development webinars you might be interested in. And uh, so that will have my contact information in there as well. Uh, so thanks everyone again for attending. We'll be sending out uh, the recording after the meeting as well. Uh, all right. Thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks again, Neil. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, great.